There you are. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Is my internet good? Yeah, you're good. Is mine good? You can hear me? Your, yours is a little... Let's it's see. wobbly. Yeah, I didn't know she told me that I can, you know, do it where I hold it. Oh, there you go. I can see you now. You're good? Yeah, you're, yeah, I'm good. Mine, usually it's mine that's the one that messes up, so so it makes me feel better. <laughs> How are you, Junior? How are you? I'm good. In the midst of this pandemic, just hanging on, you know, taking it one step at a time. How are you? I feel, I'm good. Same thing, same thing. Where are you at right now? What city are you in? Right now, I'm in New Jersey. Uh, I've uh, had the, you know, I had an artist the other day who, uh, he had a video, um, and we had to finish, finish the, you know, uh, finish that process of the video um, and just, uh, you know, get that together. Cause I had, it's been a while since I had been a involved with the label. I had, you know, previously worked with um, Chef G, Fabio Foreign, Corey Finesse, Sleepy Hollow, all these notable artists who are doing well now. So okay. I'm just getting back into that because obviously as you know, with, you know, whole football thing, I had to, you know, continue um, just pursuing, you know, other financial yeah. needs. Yeah. So you do music or? or no, I'm, I'm, I own a record label. That's where a I. A record label. Oh, yeah, okay, got it. Right I was like, you're rapping now? <laughs> no, no, I don't rap. I wish I could rap. I would have I exposed everybody already. Already, I know. Well, that's why we're here today. So if you guys aren't familiar, we have Junior Glut with us. He is a former New Orleans Saints player, as well as the Washington Redskins, who, which we're going to get right into. So they had withdrew their offer with you in 2017. So let's get right into it. Uh, why do you think the NFL is blackballing you, Junior? Well, it was in 2018. I played in oh, 2017 season and then the uh, uh, the spring of 2018, I was ranked um, top 12, well, top three pass rusher with pressure rates in my position. Mm -hmm. I was ranked as a top 50 notable free agent and had all the media outlets had basically announced that I had been back to form. As most of the fans will know, I had suffered back-to-back -back Achilles injuries uh, and, you know, was on a $50 million, $48 million deal when I was in New Orleans as a team captain. And uh, those injuries kind of derailed my career a little bit. But I got back to form in 2017, performed at a high level. And the Redskins offered me a two-year deal. But I also noticed that they offered my teammate, who didn't even play a single down that year. Mm -hmm. He was coming off a torn ACL. They offered him about a 1,000% more than I was offered in guaranteed money. So I spoke out on it. And the Redskins withdrew my deal. And I haven't, you know, played ever since. And uh, to get into deeper into that, to dive a little deeper into you know, the background as to what happened as to why I'm so sure that I got blackballed is because not only my resume, but also I had been in talks with several head coaches who were basically drooling all over to get me signed and to come over there. Sean mm -hmm. McVay being one of those head coaches, as you know, later on in 2018, he ended up going to That's the that Rams, team. right? Right, the Rams. Okay. So, okay. Um, you know, Sean McVay had basically been in talks with me. Uh, uh, Sean McVay, uh, Bill Johnson, and also... Uh, Joe Barry had all been in talks with me. Everyone was excited to get me part of the team as well. They're all were, they all were familiar with who I am. Um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't really about, Oh, we hear about this, about juniors. They know exactly who I am. I've worked with Bill Johnson for five years at the Saints. I had most of my success there. Uh, Joe Barry and uh, Sean McVay was with me in Washington. So they were very comfortable with who I was and what I could bring to the table for them. This is why they're so excited, and I have proof of all of that. And I flow up; they flew me out there. As I'm putting mm -hmm. on my cleats, they tell me workouts canceled, change of plans, and I was left with no explanation but to read in the press clipping that you know, from Sean McVay that you know, yeah, we did bring Junior Gallet in, but we didn't sign him for reasons that we will keep inside. And I, to this day, I have yet to you know hear what the reason was. I just continued to fight for my dreams, but it gets even worse because they, Seattle called me while I was in LA. And mm -hmm. basically, you know, hey, don't sign with L.A. and come to Seattle. See, see what we have to offer you. And same exact mm -hmm. thing happens. I get to Seattle at 4 in the morning. They flew me out first thing and change of plans, you know. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry for this. Uh, I, there's no explanation. I got no explanation, but the change of plans as I was tying up my cleats to go work out. So, you know, I was left Back with, to back. Right. I was left with the belief that this was, hey, this is. You know, obviously, you know, because I spoke out on pay discrimination and you know what happens to players 
when they mm-hmm. speak out, you look at Colin Kaepernick, but um, a lot of people say, hey, you know, there are other people that were given chances off the field. My issue was not off the field. I've never been convicted of a crime, and I also played in 2017 with no issues whatsoever and was also was healthy every game. So it was not that. I know people would like to change the narrative and spin that, but that's not the mm-hmm. case. The case is whenever, whenever a player speaks out, right, and, and, and yeah. stands up for himself and feels like they're being mistreated, they want to rid of that person instead of keeping them around where they can, you know, infiltrate and, and corrupt other players' minds. You know what I'm saying? So Yeah. No, I understand that. Well, do you think Snyder has a lot to do with that? Because I know that you were speaking and um, when you were speaking about him, you said that it was a very interesting, t- like it was an unf- unforgettable experience when you worked with him. Speak a little bit about that with us. Yeah, I mean, this article that I just saw, I was literally just on Twitter before you asked and saw that <laughs> there's a slew of, you know, the article that just came out with the sex scandal that he's got going on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can just look at – I, I play for New Orleans, which is a world-class organization. So to go from New Orleans Saints to, you know, the Washington Redskins, it was night and day. And you can see this is the case of what happened with Trent Williams. You know, it was a seven-time uh, uh, Pro Bowl. We did basically went through hell with several players who have voiced out their opinion on just being unhappy. You look at DJ Swearinger, who had the riff with Jay Groot. It's just always sloppy. It's never, you know, uh, there's always something sneaky going on. And it's just not, you know – an organization I, I'd want, you know, as a player, I'd want to play for, you know, and I I thought, you know, I was going to move on to a new leaf and the grass would be greener on the other side. This wasn't yeah. the case in the Washington Redskins and saw quickly how they weren't, you know, as tight knit as the, you know, New Orleans Saints organization is. Yeah. And then I, and I also heard that you said that you heard from a team owner that it's like a prison guard and inmates relationship. Did you feel like yeah, that's how you that's- felt there? Right, that's the Texans owner. He said, "Hey, we can't have the inmates uh, running the prison." It's like, what? We're not inmates, you know. We, you know, we work for your company, mm-hmm. make you know tons of money, but you guys are gonna have to treat us fair. And when you say tons of money, in comparison to what the owners make, it's not. In comparison to, of course, the you know average, you know, human being on this planet, we're one percenters. So you know, it's yeah. not. It's all relative. That's why I have to tell people, hey, I got involved with protesting with the sanitation workers the City Waste Union in New Orleans and quickly realized that the black man struggle is universal, regardless of whether you're talking about, you know, uh, millions of dollars in NFL pay or, you know, PPE or hazard pay for, you know, city, you know, sanitation workers. And I saw that four in the morning while I was protesting with them. And, you know, they're just, you know, saying that, hey, it's unfair. We're not getting paid enough. We need $15. We're getting $10 an hour. This is where the first ones to get in touch with the COVID-19 and, being that mm-hmm. we're, we're dealing with filth and uh so we we need the ppe and there has to pay and i i felt exactly what they i gravitate to a lot of the things that they were saying so you know um it, it's just really unfair and as you see we just saw just uh yesterday uh what is his name i'm sorry i can't even remember his name i just saw that he got shot seven times in the back you know oh, this yeah. ongoing issue just police brutality yeah. across this just the systemic oppression and the corrupt systems across the board um, it's something that we just need to take a hold of and grasp that before it just gets out of control. It just right now it looks like it's about to be a race war. That's what everyone is kind of hinting at, you know, and that's exactly what yeah. I don't want. You understand? Because I have kids. Of course. Um, so speaking of that, um, with priest brutality, you had an incident where the I can't breathe bit video. Tell me about that. I was watching that video and I, I, I was trying to understand what was going on. Um, I remember them asking you, um, why were you running? And you said, well, you were chasing me. You know, that's why I was yeah. running. So I, yeah. can, you under, can you explain that situation to me? No, and I, I know those were I, drops. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry. Pause. I'm sorry. You're cutting out a little bit. There you go. It's Obviously, okay. As you know, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can Obviously, hear you. Obviously, as you know, being in, being in NFL, you're held to a um, higher standard. So... I was at uh, Biloxi Beach, Black Biloxi Beach weekend in Mississippi, and a fight break out. I was at this concert, a fight break, so I wanted to get away. Um, but mm-hmm. for some reason, for some odd reason, the police officers ended up chasing There were several police officers around, and he, one of them ended up chasing me. And I didn't even realize, you know, mm-hmm. the whole time until, you know, I, I hear, like, I'm going to shoot you. you know, don't make me sh-. I heard those words. And when he tased me, obviously, I told him, um, I can't breathe. You know, I told him, I told him that. And he said, you're talking, aren't you? So that was one of the, you know, one of the instances where I faced directly 
you know, with police brutality and felt like, you know, I was so powerless and felt like I, you know, I didn't have control of my life. But at the same time, I gravitated towards what, you know, a lot of, a lot of the civilians, a lot of black civilians have been getting killed, you know, across the board in America. So um, it's mm. very unfortunate that a player, you know, NFL player, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, it does not matter just who yeah. you are. You're still black in America. It doesn't matter how much money you have. And that's what I, you know, I, I realized um, going through that situation. And then also another situation I want to ask you about, because I know that they try to blame like everything that happens off field for, you know, what's been going on with you. The beach, the beach incident when you had the belt, um, what happened there? Like how, like I know it, that was yeah, self-defense. Yeah, well that was in my, that happened in 2013. And obviously that was in my proudest moment. And I was hanging around with mm -hmm. my friends. And obviously there's some clips of the videos that not even being shown. I was attacked by four different guys. Mm -hmm. And I had to do what I had to do to defend myself. It's, obviously, I'm not proud of that moment, but that happened in 2013. I mm -hmm. never was charged for it. Um, I yeah, never I saw that. got to any criminal proceedings. And I went on to play two more years and receive the big deal from the Saints after that. Also, um, played for the Redskins. So that's not something, obviously, I'm proud of. But, you know, mm -hmm. I had to. I defended my friends. Um, obviously, if I look back at it, I would have obviously ran away from the situation, knowing who I am as a player or a person, my, the status I have, my, my name holds. But, mm -hmm. you know, looking back at it, that's just something that literally I've, I've been defending my friends my whole life. And I was put in a situation where I felt like I had to defend them. If you watch that video closely, you will see that I was doing nothing but defending people who I, you know, who yeah. were, was associated with. And that's uh, one of the big problems why I was even in that situation because I associated myself with the, you know, wrong people. But obviously I was over there and I played several years after that. Got you. No, when I watched the video, I would, you were definitely defending yourself. Um, so well, let's talk about your open letter to Commissioner Roger Goodell. You are, you are an advocate of Black Lives Matter. So um, if, talk about your letter. Have you got in a response um, to your open letter? <laughs> no, I haven't gotten a response. I, I wrote that letter like what? It's about to be three months now. And I wrote mm -hmm. that letter basically because, you know, Roger Goodell had came on and said he was open to hearing what the, you know, problems that Black players, players face throughout the league. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as far as their ideas on um, how to get rid of the um, the systemic oppression across, you know, board. And, the, and it just felt like he was actually going to listen to me. But, you know, I have yet to hear anything back. It's been it's about to be three months, as I just said, and no response. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm just open to getting some dialogue and communication going on because it's just, you know, it's really unfair. I feel like the players should have a voice and should have a huge impact on, you know, what's being said and what's going on in the league. Because you look at the ownership, it's 90% it's something, you know, white owners and coaches, 70% yeah, black. Yeah, 70%. 90%, mm -hmm. you know, 90, high 90 percentage, uh, you know, no white ownership and white coaches. So they're, they're, these are the people who make the choice and decisions of who gets to play, who gets what contract. So essentially, yeah. you know, a player not having a player – like me playing right now, my caliber for the last two years, I feel like it really, you know, it hurt, you know, o the overall brand, you know, um, because you're not getting the best product on the field. And I feel like I'm not the only guy who's, you know, been in my situation. I just feel like I'm the worst case scenario as far as being blackballed and not being able to get back in the league. But there are players yeah. who, you know, are going under the radar and not getting playing time that they deserve. And it's because of the rift they have with the coach or I can say it goes so far as even saying the race plays a part. You know, and their background 100%. plays a part. Their economic, their economic, their economic background plays. You know, their social, who they surround themselves. So that plays a part, and it's. Un I, I just don't feel like that should play a part when it comes to, you know, um, ability. One hundred percent. I know that, of course, you're familiar with Colin Kaepernick and his battle with the NFL. Kind of like I told you so. Um, speaking of, you know, what everything that's going on right now, how has he influenced you to speak out? And have you talked to him with everything that's going on? Because I feel like, you know, you guys resonate a lot with what's going on in the NFL. Yeah, no, I, he definitely inspired me because at the time he was doing it, he was getting crucified. And, you know, majority of people mm -hmm. like, well, who does this guy think he is? And then come to find yeah. out, he was, you know, seeking for a huge cause, which I felt like. I wish I had, you know, took a knee back then, you know, because I can recall in 2017 when I was on the Redskins, mm -hmm. I wanted to take a knee. We're about to play the Oakland Raiders on the Monday night football game. And my coach yeah. locked arms with me and I said, I, I want to take a knee. And he was like, you, 
you better not, you know, and something along those words. And I did, you know, I was so ashamed of, you know, who I was as a man at that time. Like, damn, I, I should have took a knee. I should have stood, you know, took a knee for something, stood for something. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, to this day, I'm, I'm very proud of what Colin did. And um, he, he started, you know, he, he spoke up for himself. And um, it's something that's inspired me. And, uh, you know, I just want to continue speaking up and being a voice for change for people who have been mistreated and just, um, you know, have, have had some race, some, some, some discrimination uh, uh, placed towards them. Understood. No, for sure. Um, you played with Drew, Drew Brees for a long time. And what did you think about his national anthem, All Lives Matter uh, comment that he made? Like, yeah, how did I mean, that make you feel? Yeah, obviously mm -hmm. I was disappointed, but um, I played with Drew Ish. Drew Brees for long enough to not be surprised at what he said, you know, because <laughs> knowing that right, yeah. I played with him long, like, I, you know, I'm not surprised. But people, you know, the public, like, oh, my God, it's like, no, this guy, you know, his grandfather was in the military and all this. He's so proud. But yeah. it's like you're not listening to what we're saying. And that's the problem right now. Like the basketball, the NBA keeps, they're, they're, they're taking pictures and, and they're, you know, they protested or whatever, like, 